Hey everybody, it's Mr. White here. So uh, happy Friday, everybody. Um, I'm gonna happily assume that we raised enough money, we raised that $10,000 that we have shortened class periods today. So um, if it's first hour, if it's second hour, if it's fifth hour, we're gonna try to keep this, this kind of short. Um, also, if it is second hour, I hope you guys have pancakes um, and I hope you're enjoying them. Um, so we have a, a journal today. And uh, our general question is, Russia chooses democracy in February 1917, right? They have that Russian revolution that hopefully you've read about so far in your textbook. So why did they actually do a 180 and go back to a more authoritarian version of communism by October 1917? What happens in that intervening eight months for there to be so much change? So that's what I want you guys to go ahead and take a moment to work on. Um, go ahead and pause this video. Um, while you guys work on your journal. And unpause once you're ready. Okay, so at this point, I hope you're done with your journal and let's get moving on and let's talk about the Russian Revolution. Uh, make sure you have your Russian Revolution notes out. Um, if you don't have them yet, this is a great time to ask your substitute teacher for them and your substitute, your substitute teacher can easily provide those to you. You can also find those notes in Schoology. So let's get started. Before we get started here, uh, I might need a little bit of a change in uh, our song here. Much better. So um, <laughs> I might actually have to stop that. Okay, okay. Let me let me let me put it into the Soviet anthem. So much. And we're back. Okay. So um, today we're going to be talking about Lenin and the rise of communism in Russia. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, why did Russia even break out into a revolution in the first place? What's going on in this crazy country? So um, our first kind of question is, what opportunities did World War I create for these communists? We know that the Russia is an important member of World War I, right? Um, the Tsar, unfortunately, is relatively unimaginative, incompetent, and incapable of actually leading the war effort. Um, he stays at home. He's not really seen as a good general or as a good leader during wartime. We also have this whole Rasputin issue, which is sort of awkward. Um, Rasputin, for those of you that don't know, is perhaps one of the weirdest men in all of history. It's basically, he's like this weird, like, Russian shaman from the countryside who kind of, like, becomes friends with the king because he can, like, heal the king's son. And... The king's son is like has a disease where he um, the doctors are not really making his disease any better. And so uh, I can't remember the actual disease his son has, but it's believed that one of the reasons why Rasputin can heal his son is because the Russian doctors are actually not even providing his son with the right medicine. And in fact, they're making his sickness worse. So when Rasputin comes in with his herbal medicine and his spiritual rituals, He's actually helping the kid just by not giving him the medicine that's hurting him. Um, the thing about Rasputin is he's creepy, he's weird, and uh, he's totally in love with the Tsar's wife. And the Tsar's kind of into that because the Tsar's really weird. So like Rasputin is like in with the Tsar's wife and the Tsar's like nice. So yeah, that's kind of weird. You know, just Rasputin being Rasputin. There's lots of Rasputin jokes to make. Um, he's also really, really huge and tall and he's just a strange guy. Anyways, the Duma, the legislature in Russia, um, is meanwhile kind of trying to push for more reform, pushing for rights for minority groups and, nation and minority nationalities. And so there's just this tension forming. You have this really incapable Tsar who's corrupted by this crazy Rasputin guy. And then the legislature is like, we want reform. And the king's like, nah, I don't feel it. So um, the goal is from the Duma and from a lot of these politicians in Russia is to improve the amount of control the local politics has, because they don't trust the national government, and they don't think the national government under the Tsar is very competent, which is a pretty fair criticism. So the knock happens here um, when World War I breaks out. Basically, um, World War I um, really puts Russia in a tough spot. The country is just simply not ready to fight a big war. There's not a whole lot of interest in fighting this war. Um, Russia is supposed to be defending Serbia, but this isn't a great way to get a lot of people to fight. It's, it's like you can't even yell for Russia, right? It's like for Serbia? Why are we fighting for Serbia? Um, so this is going to be a little bit of a problem. Also, Rasputin is killed by a bunch of Russian nobles because he's crazy and um, is misleading the king. 
Um, there's also this big conspiracy about, you know, Rasputin. He's really hard to kill. They, like, shoot him, and he doesn't die. So then they, like, stab him, and then he doesn't die. And then they have to, like, throw him in a river, and supposedly then finally he dies. Oh, also, I missed the part where they poison him. Yeah, so they poison him, they shoot him, and they stab him, and it's not enough, so they have to drown him. Can't kill Rasputin. It's creepy. So um, Germany sees this as an opportunity. Um, this All of this chaos going on in Russia over Rasputin's death and how crazy un the, uh, and unpopular the war is by 1917, uh, the German government actually cooperates with Lenin because Lenin is actually in exile. Right, Lenin's actually been hanging out outside of Russia, um, in, mostly in Germany and Switzerland. Um, he's welcome there because he's a communist, and Germany actually you know, has a socialist party and a communist party. On top of that, he is against the Tsar, and that's perceived as desirable because Germany's at war with Russia, and anything that works against the Russian government is good for Germany. So Germany actually helps Lenin uh, get a, a train ticket back to Russia. And so at this point, already, the Romanov Tsar family is, is on the brink of abdicating. You know, popular resentment against them is so heavy. So um, actually, by 1917, um, the conditions are all there. But the problem is Lenin is still stuck in Germany and Switzerland. He, he, isn't, he hasn't been able to make it back to Russia yet. And on top of that, the Communist Party was shocked that this popular revolution just kind of appears out of nowhere. So in February 1917, the people are ready for a revolution, but the actual elite revolutionaries led by Lenin are not. They're specifically not ready for a revolution. So actually, the first people to lead this revolution are the women. Uh, it's interesting, right? This feels just like the French Revolution. In the French Revolution, the first massive uprising was the Women's March to Versailles, right? The Women's March to Versailles is one of the biggest moments, right? And um, it's, it's sort of, there's like a little bit of a, a pattern going on here. Go women. So the Petrograd women and the Petrograd workers revolted. Um, and it seemed very quickly that all of Russia and the, its government seemed to collapse. There was no conspiracy. There was no plan to destroy, um, or sorry, there was no plan to input a certain kind of government into power, right? There were no communists leading this revolution. There were not even really much in the way of socialists leading this revolution. It was just a mass 1848-style revolt. For that reason, there's no clear leadership, and that's going to become a problem. This is what leads to the mass amounts of looting, destruction of property, etc. So the question really quickly becomes, who's in charge of this revolt? Um, it's not the Duma, right? The Duma is not leading this revolt. It's not the Tsar. The Tsar abdicates by March 2nd, leaving Russia in the hands of the Duma. Um, and eventually, the Duma and the Petrograd Soviet, which is sort of this you know, communist collection in the capital of, of Petrograd, um, agree on creating a provisional government. The provisional government is designed to be temporary. They put Alexander Kerensky as their leader. He is a centrist, and it is run mostly by members of the old Duma political parties. Uh, it will bring considerable reform to Russia, like uh, improvements in individual rights, in women's rights, but because it continues the, the Tsar's policy of Russia being part of World War I and fighting World War I, people hate the provisional government. It doesn't matter how many rights the provisional government brings the people. It doesn't matter how much reform happens under Alexander Kerensky. His policy of continuing World War I is so unpopular that it destroys his whole reputation. So this is part of the reason Russia chooses communism. Um, I want to give you guys a moment to, to read Lenin's kind of take on all of this. He's still in Switzerland. Um, in April 1917. This is two months after the revolution really begins, but before Russia settles on communism. So he's going to write this piece from exile in Switzerland. He's going to be giving his little appraisal, right, of the political situation. He won't really acknowledge any of the achievements of February. He won't acknowledge the ways in which the provisional government did any kind of reform because he was trying to push this narrative that we still haven't overthrown the bourgeois. Right? He still thinks there's more to do. Um, and because he's not in charge of the revolution, he thinks that this revolution isn't complete. So he's going to make a call for class four. Right? What matters not so much is the historical process, but rather the guidance of the proletariat 
by a determined political leader with the will to power at the right moment. And that, in this case, is going to be Lenin. So go ahead and um, read that on the back of your note sheet. It shouldn't take you too long. So go ahead and pause the video. Spend about five to ten minutes reading Lenin's April Theses. So read the April Theses. What's Lenin's main point? You can pause. All right, and we're back. So um, the very last thing I have for you today is a little bit of a, a review. Um, so at this point, um, you've read the April Theses. You know what kind of the lead up to the February Revolution is. Um, and so at this point, I kind of want to play this video from Epic History. Um, I'm going to mostly just let the video play, but I want to pause it a couple times to make some notes on a couple things. Um, so let's just get into it. In 1894, Nicholas II became ruler of a Russian empire that stretched from the Baltic to the Pacific. Inhabited by 126 million people from 194 ethnic groups. It was a country in which workers and peasants lived in poverty and hardship, while Russia's elite, its imperial family and aristocracy, lived lives of gilded luxury. There was a long history of struggle in Russia against the injustices of the system. And in 1905, a revolution forced the Tsar to allow the creation of a state Duma or National Assembly. But its power was limited and the compromise pleased neither the Tsar nor the reformers. In 1914, this divided empire was plunged into fresh crisis by world war. So remember, right, it's the idea that Russia's not really ever in a good spot um, after 1905. The country is still full of tension. So when they go to war, a lot of those tensions only become more severe. World War I was a disaster for Tsarist Russia. At the front, the country suffered a series of devastating defeats, while at home, there were food shortages and economic chaos. The Tsar was held responsible for the crisis. After all, he was now the army's commander-in-chief, and he was standing in the way of government reform. His German-born wife, Empress Alexandra, was even thought to be supporting Germany, while the entire family was said to have fallen under the spell of a Siberian mystic and faith healer, Grigory Rasputin. In December 1916, Rasputin was murdered by Russian aristocrats, possibly with the help of British secret agents. Both groups determined to end his influence over the Tsar. But in the eyes of many, the damage had already been done. So by 19, uh, late 1916, early 1917, the situation in Russia is pretty out of control. In a lot of the major cities, there are lots of protests, there are lots of revolts. And the Tsar is just pretty incompetent. He just doesn't really realize how serious the situation is getting at any point in time, in part because of this weird influence that Rasputin has. He almost brainwashes the king into thinking, or the Tsar, sorry, into thinking that everything's just fine. On the 23rd of February, 1917, thousands of women took to the streets of the Russian capital Petrograd to mark International Women's Day and protest over bread shortages. The next day they were joined on the streets by workers and students carrying placards that read, Down with the Tsar. 
troops, ordered to put down the disorder, mutinied and joined the protesters instead. Tsarist officials were arrested. Prisons and police stations were attacked. Emblems of Tsarist rule smashed and burned. The government had lost control of the capital. The Tsar was told by his ministers that order could only be restored and Russia saved from military defeat if he gave up power. So on the 2nd of March, Nicholas agreed to abdicate. In just 10 days, 300 years of Romanov rule had come to an end. The February Revolution had been remarkably swift and bloodless, and hopes were now high for the creation of a more democratic, more just Russian state. Members of the State Duma the National Assembly had formed a provisional government, which was to hold power until a constituent assembly was elected, to give Russia a new constitution. But in reality, the provisional government shared power with the Petrograd Soviet, a council elected by workers and soldiers that controlled the capital's troops, transport and communications. The Petrograd Soviet dominated by the Socialist Revolutionary Party and the Marxist Menshevik Party, was much more radical than the provisional government. So the provisional government from the people in the State Duma is made up of a lot of centrist politicians. It's where Alexander Kerensky comes from. The Petrograd Soviet, and what a Soviet is, right, is this council of, of basically socialists and communists. So what's interesting here is they're actually forced to share power with this council in Petrograd because they actually control basically the military, because the military agrees with their ideas. So the provisional government legally, or supposedly legally, has all the power, but in this case, practically, they're reliant on the Petrograd Soviet to get anything done. Yet it supported the government's decision to continue the war, and honor the commitments that Russia had made to the Allies. It was a fateful decision that ultimately played into the hands of one of the smaller parties, the Bolsheviks. Their leader, Vladimir Lenin, recently returned from 16 years in exile, bitterly opposed the imperialist war. He also demanded the immediate redistribution of land from rich landowners to peasants and the transfer of power from the bourgeois provisional government to the people's soviets or councils that were springing up across Russia. The Bolshevik program was summed up in a simple slogan bread, peace and land. And as Russia's economic and military crisis deepened, its appeal to the masses grew and grew. In June, a new Russian military offensive ended in disaster. Several theses are going to be published kind of, I think it's April 2nd or 3rd. He basically publishes it and then he hops on the train to go to Russia. So it's written from exile and then as he's returning, it's getting spread around Russia. So basically it's almost heralding Lenin's return. With 400,000 Russian casualties, massive desertions, and the collapse of army morale and discipline. In July, soldiers and sailors in Petrograd mutinied. They were joined in the streets by workers with Bolshevik support. But troops loyal to the provisional government opened fire on the protesters and dispersed the crowds. A police crackdown followed leading to the arrest of several Bolshevik leaders, including Leon Trotsky. While Lenin, with the help of Joseph Stalin, fled to Finland, traveling with forged papers under the name of Konstantin Ivanov. A 
a socialist and stirring orator named Alexander Kerensky, became Russia's new prime minister, and was hailed as the man who would save Russia from anarchy. The army's commander-in-chief, General Kornilov, believed Russia's war effort was being undermined by chaos at home, and deliberately sabotaged by men like Lenin, whom he declared a German spy. So in August, he ordered his men to march on Petrograd, to restore order. Bolsheviks played a leading role in the city's defence against this attempted military coup. Their most brilliant organiser, Leon Trotsky, was released from prison and sent armed Bolshevik militias, the Red Guards, to defend key points in the city. So Trotsky is like the right-hand man of Lenin. So he gets out of prison thanks to Bolsheviks kind of obtaining power in some of these cities like Petrograd, the capital of Russia. By the way, Petrograd is the same city as St. Petersburg, same city. So uh, just it, the city's been renamed like a bunch of times. So anyways, um, Trotsky is kind of the right-hand man. He's still in Russia, and so he's going to lead this revolt against the Russian general Kornilov. So Kornilov, basically, because he works for the provisional government, because he works for the military, he hates the Bolsheviks because they're undermining the war effort. And that's why Trotsky and Kornilov are butting heads in Petrograd. Strikes by railway workers, many of them Bolshevik supporters, prevented Kornilov from moving his men by rail. And his soldiers began to switch sides, or simply go home. The Kornilov affair cast the Bolsheviks as saviors of the revolution. And by the end of September, they'd gained a majority in the Petrograd Soviet. In October, Lenin decided the time had come. He secretly returned from Finland to Petrograd and began preparing to seize power. This is such a telling quote from Lenin. It would be naive to wait for a formal majority for the Bolsheviks. No revolution ever waits for that. History will not forgive us if we do not assume power now. This is a trend that continues almost every authoritarian leader. They basically take power often without a majority. I mean, when Hitler took power, the Nazis were only 43% of Germany. So Lenin doesn't have a majority. The Bolshevik party is not the biggest party. More people believe in more democratic forms of socialism or less radical forms of communism than what Lenin believes in. But the Bolsheviks take power because they have armed On the 25th of October, the Bolsheviks made their move. Red Guards and loyal troops seized key points around the capital. And that night, they stormed the provisional government's headquarters at the Winter Palace. An event later immortalized by Bolshevik propaganda and the great Soviet filmmaker Sergei Eisenstein. Kerensky fled the city at the last moment, narrowly avoiding capture. And the next day, at the Second All-Russian Congress of Soviets, Lenin announced the overthrow of the provisional government. The following months saw the Bolsheviks consolidate their hold on power while fighting a brutal civil war against counter-revolutionary, or white Russian, forces who had foreign support. Some whites hoped to put Tsar Nicholas back on the throne. After his abdication, Nicholas and his family had been held under guard. Pause here, actually. This is probably more than enough that we need. Uh, the truth is, is it, from here on out, is just they're going to talk about the Russian Civil War. So we can kind of see how now Russia splits up. Right. And basically, starting in 1918, the Soviets controlled pretty much all of central Russia. All right. 
really western, central, this is the industrialized region of Russia. Only the northern portion up here, the eastern portion, and the southern portion by Ukraine are going to be held by the whites. Um, so it's the whites versus the reds. The reds are Lenin's communists. The whites are made of a variety of different leaders, like Kerensky and Kornilov, who um, are opposing the communist government. In fact, a lot of rural, some rural farmers in the south, um, in Ukraine, and some uh, of the military out in Siberia and in the north near Arkhangelsk will fight against the communists. And they'll actually receive support from the west. They'll receive support from Britain and America. But they don't win. So the Tsar will be killed. Um, uh, Kerensky will be forced to flee. Kornilov will be killed. All these people um, will essentially lose this fight against communist Russia. And by 1921, 1922, the Russian Civil War starts to wind down. The whites of uh, the White Guard or the White Russians are kind of defeated, and Russia consolidates under communist rule. So um, that's kind of our story for the Russian Revolution. Um, you can kind of check in with any of the details in the Russian Civil War uh, and all that stuff uh, in your textbook. And just be ready for our Chapter 18 homework check on Monday. Uh, that's pretty much all I have for you guys today. I will see you on Monday. And if you have any questions or you need any review or anything, let me know. Have a good one. Enjoy your weekend.